the burden of proof lies on the accused. So I want you to think about this. So if you are accused of a crime by the police, they have to, you go to trial, it is their job to prove you did it. It is their job to prove that you are guilty. It is not, yes, it is, but it's not your job to prove you're innocent. It's their job to prove you're guilty. So the term burden of proof lies on the prosecution, not on the defense. Now, with witch hunts, the burden of proof lies on the defense. How do you prove you're not a witch, a, witch, a communist? How do you prove you're not some of those things? You can't. And so you think about labels that can be thrown around that can be very destructive to a person's credibility. Do you watch The Bachelor? Yes. It's like on The Bachelor how they went around saying that she was an escort and then she was trying to get a job but they thought she was an escort so they didn't get her. And everybody's like backlashing her. Yeah. Her friends won't talk to her because they think she is on the yeah, because she she's getting more TV time. Uh, she got some press now. She's getting, she's getting more money. There you go. Now, I want you to think about it like this, and I don't want you to misunderstand what we're about to speak about, but I want you to think about it like this. Are there certain labels today that you definitely don't want to have put on you? Are there certain labels that you definitely would not want to be used to represent who you are? Yes. yes. Yeah. And so oftentimes if those labels get out and enough people hear those labels per se, yeah. then rumors people believe. become believed to be true and people pass those on as truth, yeah. right? And change them. And, and sometimes they embellish stories. Now, please don't misunderstand that, but it, it can happen. And so what's the problem with this? Are there people who were in the government in the in the twenties and thirties who were spies? Yes. yes. In fact, one thing I liked about or I thought was interesting about the article is after reading the article, do you think Kiss was a spy? Okay, he actually was. He was a spy. It, there was some information released by Russia in the nineties, and they released a list of. Uh, American spies basically does. Now, by this time, these people were dead, pretty much. But Kiss was on that list. And so he was a spy. Now, they couldn't prove he was a spy, but how they got him is Chambers was able to prove that he and Hiss knew each other. And one of the things Hiss said under oath is that he had never met um, Oz, I don't remember if he calls him Oswald or Whitaker in your article because both of the, his name is Oswald Whitaker Chambers and sometimes he goes by Oswald and sometimes he goes by Whitaker. I had to read a really long book about him in grad school. That would be this one. And his story is actually pretty That's interesting because he had a feeling he eventually leaves his job as a communist spy and he has a feeling at some point he's going to need this evidence that proved he was a spy. And so he took pictures um, of the evidence that he had, and he is going to keep those pictures. He doesn't develop them. He keeps them on a film canister, and he moves it around at different times. And so when he comes forward about this, he goes out to his garden and cuts a hole in a pumpkin and shoves that film canister. Film canisters are about that, that big around, and they're about that tall. He shoves it up in the pumpkin because, like, if you're going to go raid somebody's house looking for something, you're probably not going to go out to their produce. Yeah. And so, long story short, while he is talking with uh, the House and American Activities Committee, he tells them that he has evidence, and they're like, all right, let's see it. He's like, well, it's in my house. And so they actually escort him out to his house, and his house has been ransacked. And they're like, well, it's probably not here anymore. And he's like, oh, yeah, it is. And so they go out to the garden, and he pulls them out, and they're nicknamed the Pumpkin Papers. <laughs> Happily. But great little story there. Um, the first, like, it's, it's like a 1,300-page book. The first 250 to 300 pages were so fascinating, and the rest of his life is really pretty boring. So it definitely went downhill. Uh, but anyway, so Hiss was a spy. 
Although people at this time did not know that. And what matters more than the truth sometimes is what people believe to be true. Yes, when he gets out of prison, he goes on speaking tours. Talking about how he was falsely accused. And like Americans are behind him. They're buying his book. Like he is the perfect example of someone who is denied their rights to what? Going down to the end. That's it. However, at the same time, you know, if they could not prove even the stuff that his like that Chambers presents never proved he was a spy. It proved that he lied about knowing Chambers. And so, you know, it's kind of one of those tricky things. If he would have just admitted in all honesty that he knew Chambers, then they really could have would have had a hard time ever convicting him. So anyway. The Hollywood Ten, of course, were a group of directors. And what did they get in trouble for? Not, not, not what? They refused to answer. Now, let's think about our Constitution for a minute, our Bill of Rights. Isn't there an amendment that says you do not have to answer if you might incriminate yourself? Yep. You have the right to remain silent if what you say may incriminate yourself. And if you have that right, then should they be arrested for refusing to answer? No. No. Now, the police can hold you a certain amount of hours, but if they can't charge you after that time, I mean, this, this is a direct violation of the Constitution. I find it interesting when people mention his more because I think, realistically, the Hollywood Ten are really who kind of I get more upset about with the two. All right. And so another important figure that I want to make sure you take away from here is the young Richard Nixon. Nixon is one of the head prosecutors for HUAC. This is where Richard Nixon's name gets out there and where Nixon becomes famous. Nixon is a Nixon. Nixon is a HUAC prosecutor. And so this is where he becomes kind of a celebrity, if you will. All right. So let's move forward. The bigger issue, yes, it is important that somebody in our agricultural department may or may not be selling secrets to the Russians. But the big issue is here. All of a sudden, one day, the Russians are going to... Um, prep and use, well, test, I should say, not use, an atomic bomb. Wait a minute, how did they get the recipe? Spice. That's right. One particular spice, so they start tracing this. It actually es escalates to the point, yes. It won't fit the charger. All right. Um, try someone else's charger or a different charging point. Different insert. And what, what are the all things called? No, it was just working. It's just not working anymore. Try, see, try somebody else's cord real quick. Is it the flat one or? Oh, yeah. yeah, try her cord and just see it. Maybe a bad cord. Because it's that's a very easy fix, and that does happen sometimes because sometimes those will get those cords will get bent. You know how you like your, your iPhone cords, you know, your iPhones that you have at home. Sometimes those cords go badly. The lightning cords, man, they go badly fast. Wait, which one? The lightning cords. Yeah. I mean, you left it home this morning. You come back, it's still in charge, right? Right. All right, see if that will give you a minute. If not, I will email Miss Rebecca. I mean, well, either way, I probably will email Miss Rebecca. But nothing? All right. Okay, so anyway, what you're going to see here is it is they start to investigate. They start to investigate because what they find is that they have a, um, they know they have a leak because the Russians don't have it, and all of a sudden they they use this bomb and it, you know, they test it and it's successful. Um, Truman and uh, other dudes found out at the same time at the same place. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, but that doesn't mean the other dude, which was uh, Stalin, Stalin, actually has the quote unquote kind of recipe. He doesn't have the here's how you build a bomb. Okay, he unwatched the YouTube video. So here's what takes place all of a sudden, he has it. 
So pretty much the things you do is you follow the spy network, you follow the, and we had some double agents, we know that, and you also follow the money trail. And so at first they blocked all the scientists who had been working on the project from access to it, including Robert Oppenheimer, whose work is believed to be what finally finished the bomb. Like they're like, yeah, we know you created this, but you're out. <laughs> Literally, blocked him. And so what they end up realizing is the guilty party was a scientist named Julius Rosenberg. This is Julius and his wife, Ethel. And uh, they're, they're younger. Um, pictures don't really do them justice. A lot of times black and white pictures make people look older anyway. But they have two young children. And she had actually driven him to the meet. And so, therefore, she is guilty as well. This is an act of treason. And so how is this handled? Well, they handle it by calling them in. And they basically are like, look, we know you did this. And they give him an option. Now, this is where we don't like Julius. They give him the option. They're basically like, look, dude, you can take the blame here. We know all your wife did is drive you there, but we need you to admit that you did this. And I get why they're doing that, because, you know, they, like, television ate them up. Like, they absolutely love them because they're this young couple, and here they are, and they're facing against the evil government. What the government just did to poor kiss, and, you know, and so the television is eating them up as, like, just kind of victims. We love victims, right? I mean, we did. When victims sell. And so they go in and they're like, Julius, admit you did this. And he's like, I didn't do it. They're like, if you know you did this, admit you did it. And he's like, I didn't do it. And they're like, if you will admit you did it, we will give your wife a lesser charge. She'll maybe serve a year or two at best. She'll get out on parole and your kids will have their mother. And Julius is like, but I didn't do it. <laughs> they're both convicted. They're both going to sit in the electric chair. Oh. Now, there's a thing about body chemistry and electricity. Do you know your body system has electricity in it? Yeah. And all of our electrical systems are wired a little differently. Julius, they sit him down in old Sparky. Fire that thing up first time it kills him. Ethel. Now... It's been a long time since I studied this, and my number may be slightly off, but it's not far. Her body chemistry and electricity did not jive with the electric chair. And if I'm remembering correctly, they electrocuted her nine times before she died. They say after four, your brain dead. So, but I'm sure by the third, she was so mad at that man. By the way, when all the information came out in the 90s, it is definitely Julius Rosenberg who sold those nuclear secrets. Yeah. I just do not like him. Like, you could be a spy, but at least, like, you know, let your wife. I mean, you're going to have to get electrocuted anyway. And, you know, yeah. And, I, and then at the same hand, I'm kind of mad at her. I'm like, you need to rat him out. Because you know what snitches get? Immunity. Snitches get immunity. <laughs> I mean, there is a benefit right here. Stitches are better than the electric chair. Nine times. Nine times better than the electric chair and the nine times in the electric chair. All right. So let's move forward. But Julius and Ethel, they're kind of the culmination of this whole hunt for communists. And, you know, but it also brings fear. Americans are torn. Some are afraid. Some are feeling like their rights are violated. And so it's kind of all over the place. And that is why I ask you the question. I hope you put a little bit of thought into it. At what point do personal rights and national security meet? Because that's a hard question, isn't it? We want our rights protected. But we don't always want someone else's rights protected. And someone in Second Block asked a question that I thought was a very pertinent question. That was a good question. It means important, significant. And they said, why, if you are being questioned, why wouldn't you answer if you know you didn't do it? Like, if you know you weren't a director who was trying to be a con. That's right. If you watch enough criminal stuff, if somebody, I mean, like, you know, you get somebody who's a savvy questioner that they question people all the time, their job is to get you to confess. 
And sometimes if they convince themselves in their mind that you did it, and you know, sometimes it looks like you did, then they can question you enough to where you sound guilty. And you think you did it. <laughs> or you trip up. Or occasionally people even confess their question for so long. I was listening to one the other day, and it was about like when the evidence makes it look that way, um, it's hard not to believe it. And there was this one particular example where they found this girl and she had been murdered. And she'd been missing for quite some time, maybe a couple, I don't remember if it was, it could have been as few as a couple of months, and it might have been a couple of years. But in some of the attire that she had on, it seems like it was a jacket to me, but I may be mixing that up with a different case. But they found this hair that was not hers. And so you would assume that hair belongs to the assailant, right? And so they run the hair, and they get a DNA match. However, the person that the DNA matches was in prison and was still in prison for like six months before she was ever missing. So this could have been this jacket that she bought. It could have just been some cross-contamination somewhere. And so just because all fingers point one way doesn't always mean that's the answer. We're having a historical experience in this room. Hey. Hey. Okay, sure. To what area? To where? Okay. Let's just go get guided. All right. So anyway, we're gonna kind of backtrack and say yes. Yes. Yeah, I love the movie My Cousin. Bing. It's a really good film. Yeah, and he proves how like everything looks like when you first look at that case, everything looks like they did it, but the guy's like, you didn't do it. Yeah, when like, I was watching, I was like, did I don't miss something. Yeah, there's a court case you would probably find interesting, and it's Gideon versus Wainwright, and it is why you have the right to an attorney, and it's one of those that it looks like everything looks like you did it. But when you actually get and uncover the right things, it didn't happen. All right. So let's check this out. In the election of 1948, backtracking a little bit because we talked about Truman's term. Let's talk about Truman's election. So Truman, the first term, he gets the easy way, right? You know, he follows up FDR when FDR dies. So in Truman's term on his own, Truman is going to represent the Democratic Party because that's the party he was a part of. Dewey is going to represent the Republicans. So let's talk about this third controversial figure. There is a third name on the ballot, and that is Strom, S-T-R-O-M, Thurman. Strom Thurman had been a Democrat, but he and a few others have some fundamental issues. Uh, they, they have some... Fundamental would be like what you believe, what you're about. He has some fundamental issues with Truman's policies of desegregation. He feels like that Truman should not have had the right to order desegregation in the military. He believes that issues like desegregation belong to the state. Now, to slightly play devil's advocate here, I agree that everything should be desegregated. However, at that time, to be fair, there was a court case that supported segregation. What was the court case? Plessy versus Ferguson. And so it said that segregation was constitutional. So legally, does the government have a right to enforce segregation? Well, do you do the right thing because it's the right thing, or do you do the right thing because it's legally supported? Uh, now, I agree with Truman's policies, but that's Strom's argument. Now, don't get me wrong. Strom is not exactly a person who embraces black people. I do believe his policies are racially based and racially motivated. But his argument is kind of historically sound. And that is why, at the same time, you have the NAACP that is working their tail off to try to get cases to Congress to get Congress to reverse Plessy versus Ferguson, because till you reverse it, or until an amendment is passed, it's very hard to fight segregation, unfortunately. Thurman, though, Thurman is pretty openly, aside from his statements being kind of legally accurate, he's pretty openly racist. 
And he is going to run on a party called the Stage Right Party or the Dixie Crap Party. Now, anytime, obviously seeing it's the Dixie Crats, what party is he coming out of? He's coming out of the Democrats. And so anytime you split a political party, what usually happens? The other party wins. That's how Wilson became president. Speaking of racism. So, so here's what happens. This is the one time in our history that a party splits and still wins. And in fact, it's kind of an interesting election. So the prediction, um, and he's the Dixie Kratz. All right. So the prediction was that Dewey was going to win. That was the prediction. Truman made the South angry because he had desegregated the military which technically the military falls under the federal government, not the state, so they had the right to do whatever they wanted. But what's going to happen here is it the results are so, at first they come in so strong for Dewey, and he wins some very big states. If you've watched any election, like the recent elections or any others, you know that New York is a whole heck of a lot of votes. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, or I should say, is a whole heck of a lot of votes. Florida at this time wasn't as big because you're still having, this is when you're starting to have that Sun Belt that we talked about yesterday where people are starting to move, particularly to Florida and Texas. In fact, if you look at Texas at this time, it's kind of small comparatively. Look at California, it's small comparatively. And so that's when you still see that Sun Belt happen. You still see that migration. But what ends up taking place is although... The Republicans are going to come out very strong in that New England area. The Democrats are going to come out very strong when you get to the coast, to the West Coast. And so it is so strong that Chicago, Illinois, goes ahead and prints and delivers their newspapers saying that Dewey defeats Truman. Dewey went to bed on that November 9th thinking he was the president. And so his Secret Service agents were outside his door, and his campaign manager comes in the early hours of the morning, and he's like, "I got to speak to Dewey." And the guy says, uh, "The guy that's outside his door, not wish to be disturbed." And he said, "Well, unless you got Harry Truman in there, wake Dewey up and tell him he's not president." Which I thought was kind of rude. Let the guy like breakfast. Give him about an hour or so before you're like, so. Maybe he was showing the Chicago newspaper and say, we're going to let you keep this. And so the Chicago paper was actually printed and delivered. Newspapers were usually delivered in the wee hours in the morning uh, because that way there was nobody else on the street. It was very easy to do the delivery. And so this is a famous picture of Harry Truman smiling as he holds the incorrect newspaper that says Dewey defeats Truman. And so I'm sure if I were Truman, I would have like kept that paper for the rest of my life. It's like not so fast. Now, so we've talked about Truman's foreign policy with containment, Korea, Turkey, Greece, Marshall Plan, all that. Let's talk about Truman's domestic policy. Now I'm going to be fair to Truman. I don't think Truman was the most brilliant president we've ever had, as far as academically, but. You know, probably the most brilliant president we ever had was not good in a lot of ways either. I do think, though, Truman is, Truman and I have a very similar philosophy on something, and that's a, if it ain't broke philosophy. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so Truman, basically, his policy is we're going to keep doing the stuff the New Deal did because that kind of worked. He had been under, I mean, he had a huge respect for FDR, and so it makes sense. However, you don't want to call your policy what that guy said, right? And so instead of having the New Deal, which was our second deal, he called it the Fair Deal. And so we have three programs that end with deal, and you need to get these straight in your head as to whose program is whose. So who is the Square Deal? Square is TR. All right. Then you have the New Deal. Because first of all, you had to have a square one before you could have a new one. New means you already had one. And then after the New Deal, we have the Fair Deal, which is like, uh, it's almost like he's trying to copy FDR. And this is true. Okay. 
and Truman comes immediately at him. So here's what you need to know about the fair deal. He's like, we're going to extend the New Deal programs. We're going to extend Social Security. We're going to raise minimum wage. All of these things were kind of in line with what FDR wanted to do, right? Also, he wants to build low-income housing. So these are houses geared that would be affordable for people with lower incomes. He also wants to do rent control. What rent control is, is to keep like your landlord from continually jacking up your rent price. Uh, I remember rent control. Yeah, we he vetoed it under the previous act. Yeah, he wants to impose it. He wants to impose it. I'm not, the reason he vetoed it under Taft Hartley is because the way it went about, he did not approve. He also wants farm support on parity. Now, let me explain to you what this is. You know what this is, but it doesn't look clear here. What did FDR do to help out farms? He, um, oh, he did the right? Well, he did that. And yeah. what about crops? He made, the he made them normal. He made them, yeah, he made them grow less, right? In that Agriculture Adjustment Act. So he scaled down the amount produced. And then he gave them a, uh, the word stimulus has been in my mind all day, and that's the wrong one. It's a not stipend, same thing. Stimulus, no. Um, subsidy. Yeah, another S word. Yes, he gave them a subsidy for not growing as much to make up their income, right? That's all this is. It's just different words. Parity scaled down would mean that you're scaling part of it down, like a partial scale down, okay? All right. He also makes more civil service jobs, people working for the government. Isn't that very new deal of him? Yeah. And then also, he expands our Reclamation Bureau. That is our group that does national parks. Also very new deal of him. Did you know that the National Park Service handles historic sites? Yeah. Like if you went to the birthplace of Abraham Lincoln, if you went to the battlefield of Gettysburg, isn't I, I would assume so. I didn't know it. I, I would have thought that that was uh, privately owned, but it may not be. They may have turned it over. But places like that, yes. So any place that is, his, if it is a National Historic Landmark, it falls under the National Park Service. Yes? Uh, the house that my grandma used to build over before she died, that they still have now, um, they wanted Someone came to them and wanted to put it under that, like, really? historical building place. Because they had all of, like, the old architecture, all of, like, the old, like, cooking items. The whole house yeah. looked like an antique shop. Oh, wow. And they wanted to do that, and they were like, no. And I would guess it would be a private property. I mean, I guess... Well, that wouldn't fall under eminent domain because it wouldn't be for public use. Yeah, was, and I would guess if it's still family owned. Yeah, yeah. It was some mayor of Virginia's house during the Civil War thing. Yeah, Virginia loves their monuments too. And so, at any rate, what happens, all of this sounds exactly like the stuff FDR is doing. So, pretty much, he's like, New Deal, yeah. round two, let's go. All right. So pretty much when you think of Truman's programs, if it sounds like, ask yourself, WWFDR, D. What would FDR do? And if it sounds like something FDR would do, Truman is going to try to do it. All right. So let's move on to President Eisenhower. Now, Eisenhower, to me, I've always thought about him. He was the oldest president we've ever had up until that point. By the way, both the last one and the current one are older than me. Uh, but, you know, I... You look at him and he looks so old. Like, you know, but there, and you think about, you know, not that Joe or Trump look young, but like still, they, they look younger than him, you know? But anyway, I just think of Eisenhower's like Papa, you know? He has that old Papa look. So I want to show you something that I think you might enjoy. This is Eisenhower's political ad in 1952. So the television is coming on the scene in the early 50s. And it becomes exponentially popular very quickly with those fancy 13-inch screens, right? And so this is this is his slogan and his ad. And so let me play this for you. Do what? Yeah. 
going the other way in the background yeah the donkey is leaving the White House that's right and of course he's on what elephant Republican Party. Okay. It's, it's, yeah, they didn't at that time. It's like an abbreviation for Dwight and Eisenhower kind of together. I believe it's a nickname he gained as a child. So I want to re-look at this part with you real quickly. Uh, go ahead and take your cord and computer to the office. She's up there in the front. She's in the front today. All right. So look at this. He's about, they're about to talk about three people we don't want. Notice the symbolism, they're donkeys, right? Democratic Party. And let's listen to what their names are. We don't want John or Harry. Let's do that big job right. So Harry was Harry Truman. John is one of the guys who runs against him, and Dean was another serious competitor. So those aren't just random names. Like, you know, those are deliberate. Yeah, and they do sound like, it does sound good, but if you actually listen to it, and it's funny too, I, I found this colorized version, and before I found the colorized one, you really don't see the, the donkey leaving the White House. It shows up better in the colorized, in my opinion. All right, so let's continue on. Um, so Eisenhower promises us that he is going to try to turn his attention and his funding away from war at the same time that he's promising us he's going to end the Korean War. And he has this very famous quote that I want to share with you, and it's this. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in a final sense a theft from those who are hungry and not fed. So if we're doing all this military buildup, we can't feed our hungry people. Those who are cold and not clothed. In the world, in arms and spending money alone, it is spending in the sweat of the laborers. It is the genius of his science scientists and the hopes of his children. So basically, if we're having to spend all this money on the Cold War, we're stealing from where we can help other people. Now, although he says those things, we do end up with a lot of military buildup because of some of the things that are going to happen in his administration. One thing Eisenhower does is he promotes something that I think is a really good thing. But it is more expensive than the entire New Deal together, like the whole New Deal. And that is the Eisenhower interstate system. So if you want to travel some, somewhere a significant distance, your best bet, if possible, is to take the interstate, right? Yes. It's much faster. Uh, if you've driven like somewhere like New Orleans or as far as that on Highway 90 versus going on the interstate, it takes a lot longer. And so Eisenhower, when he was in serving in World War II, when he traveled through Germany, he is going to notice the Audubon. And the Audubon is the German, basically it's what we would consider the interstate. And it connects all the major cities. It is made to where you could go very fast. And so the idea was to quickly transport troops, supplies, etc. And so that was one of the things that Hitler had established, which was actually pretty brilliant. You know, you needed fast access, right? And so this becomes something that Eisenhower says we don't have and we need. And so we are going to establish an interstate system, which you can get on I-10 over in Florida and go all the way to California. Just straight over. So at some day, I will probably do that, but not this week. Now, I-10 will take you all the way to California. you don't have to now, 65, if you stay on 65, um, it goes through Birmingham, um, and uh, it goes up through Nashville, and it'll go all the way up 
Uh, we usually, we, we exit towards 59, which takes you up towards Knoxville, but there's all sorts of interstates. What about New York? Uh, New York, you would take, actually, to go to New York, you would take uh, 65 to 50, oh, thank you, to 59. Um, and then out of 59, I'd have to look to see how you turn out of there. But we always take that way going to uh, to D.C. We go the same way that we go to Knoxville and kind of up towards there. All right. So I-10 will take you always to California. I-10 is, yeah, it runs all the way across. I would think it would be, of course, I mean, oh, you're one of those people that take a long, yeah, you and my husband would agree on this. Like, he likes to do the back, no. I believe my goal is to beat the time on my, yes. I'm like, all right, you think it's going to be, you think it's going to take me that long? Just watch me, watch me. I mean, like, I'm, I'm to the point, I would be happy going through, like, a drive through and like, all right, you get out real quick. I'm going to go and go to the bathroom, and then we can switch. And so by the time we get around, we got the food, everybody's ready to go, everybody's potty, and we're out because we got to beat that time. I don't play. Okay. Yes. Even if it's I think I'm going to go to California. Yeah. This summer, next summer, in car, but we're going to take it to a long way. We're not going there to I think we're going to go. Well, I think we're good. Yeah. If you're going that way to California, you take it up. I would, I mean, if you had the time, there would be a lot of cool places to stop along the way. But I, I, I don't mind, like, specific wave stations, but I don't want to, like, just go to the road where it takes me. I don't do that. I like, I like a plan. All right, so check this out. Eisenhower's VP is going to be none other than young Richard Nixon, who made a name for himself in the Red Scare. Think about why he picked young Nixon. Well, for one thing, Eisenhower's old. Nixon young. Eisenhower didn't have Washington experience. Nixon had been involved in Washington politics for a few years at this point. Nixon comes across as hard on communism, where Eisenhower hasn't proven himself against the communists. And so Nixon was a smart choice. However, once he chose Nixon, some questions came up. And one of those was, had Nixon had some illegal campaign fund dealing? Now, this has nothing to do with Watergate. This is during Eisenhower's election. And so, I want to show you a famous speech by Nixon called the Checkers Speech. And then we will talk about what that speech means. We've already spotted a communist. There we go, Checkers. I come before you tonight as a candidate for the vice president and as a man whose honesty and putting integrity has been questioned. A usual political thing to do when charges are made against me is to either ignore them or to deny them without giving details. I believe we've had enough of that in the United States, particularly with the present administration in Washington, D.C. To me, the office of the Vice President of the United States is a great office. I feel that people have got to have confidence in the integrity of the men who run for that office and who might attend. I have a theory, too, that the best and only answer to a smear or to an honest misunderstanding of the facts is to tell the truth. Pat doesn't have a mink coat, but she does have a respectable republic. And I always tell her that she's the good in anything. One other thing I probably should tell you, because if I don't, they'll probably be saying this about me too. We did get something in here after the election. A man down in Texas heard Pat on the radio mention the fact that our two youngsters would like to have a dog. And believe it or not, the day before we left on this campaign trip, we got a message from Union Station, Baltimore, saying they had a package for us. We went down to get it. You know what it was? It was a little Cocker Spaniel dog in a crate that he got all the way from Texas. Black and white, sparse. And our little girl Tisha, the six-year-old, named it Ken. You know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, 
So he talks about, if you watch the whole speech, which I'm not going to show you the whole one, it's kind of long, but he talks about how he's not a rich man, and he talks about the honest ways to make money in Washington, and he basically says, I didn't do any of those honest ways, which is kind of funny. And then he talks about, and so that's why he comes out, and he's like, yeah, my wife, Pat, doesn't have a meat coat because we don't have a lot of money, and she has a, a respectable cloth Republican coat, uh, which, you know, whatever. And so then he comes into the end. He never answers, like, the question as that they're asking about how these campaign funds got kind of convoluted. And he comes in because what you can get in trouble for with campaigns is if you take money from people and you do not disclose it. So as a person running for office, there are two things you have to do. One, anybody that gives you money towards your campaign, it has to be documented if it's over, like, $200. So if somebody hands you 10 bucks, I don't think you have to document that. But it's over, I think it's 200 is the amount you have to you have to put who gave that to you. And then you have to show how any campaign funds that come in are spent. Okay. So that all has to be there, the records have to be kept to make sure that you're just not saying you're running for office and doing all these things and you just pocket all the money. All right. And so you know, it's illegal and you get in a lot of trouble for it. Well, you have to still account for that money. You just don't have to say who it came from. If it's below a certain amount, you just say donation $10. It's not illegal. Can there be like private donations? If it's over a certain amount, you have to disclose who it is. Now, what sometimes people will do is like if it's anything over 200, like for instance, they may get like, you may get donations from like 10 family members. But if it's anything over a certain amount, you have to disclose who it is. All right. So anyway, Nixon comes at the end of this, and he never really answers some of the things he's accused of. And then he says, there is one thing that we have gotten in this election, which I'm going to go ahead and disclose, or they'll say I've stolen it too. And he tells this little sweet story about his girls wanting a dog, and this guy sending them a dog, and how cute the dog is. And he said, and we named it Checkers, and we're keeping the dog. And you know what Americans took away from this? Aw, sure. checkers. That's right. And so they took away that Nixon is a dog lover. And as Americans, we love dog lovers. And so what happens is Nixon goes from being thought to be a, a crook at this point to a puppy lover, which who can go wrong? Everybody almost loves puppies. It's, it's brilliant politics. I mean, like, it is the – it's – to me, it's the traditional cloak and dagger. Like, you're paying attention to the right hand when the left hand is over here doing something else. <laughs> Nixon, he's actually dead. He died early 2000s. You're thinking of Carter. Yeah. Carter's still alive. He's, he's way in his 90s. Okay, so check this out. So let's go back. I just want to mention the checker speech to you because it's such kind of a neat little story. But anyway. So let's talk about some of Eisenhower's other issues. Foreign policy. I'm going to make this part really quick. Here's the deal. Problems are starting to heat up in Vietnam. At this point, we're not going to send troops, but we do send money. And so we do send money to Vietnam to help the, the French Vietnamese that are fighting, but we don't send any people at this point. And basically, I say this because when we talk about Vietnam in a couple of units, I'm going to go back to kind of where all of Vietnam started. And I want to make sure you associate it with it didn't just start all of a sudden one day in the 60s. All right. So first you have at this point, even with we're having problems and we are getting involved in Vietnam by sending money. The second major place that's connected here is West Germany. West Germany is officially granted sovereignty. Sovereignty means self-rule. They're officially granted self-rule. What that means is they can now rule themselves. They can be members of the United Nations, and they can be members of NATO. Yes. It's okay. But isn't it being like... They're actually not that close to each other, but what ends up happening is when they're taught, they're often taught together. 
and see like, okay, so if you're, I'll show you on a map real quick. It'll make more sense to you. It's not a bad question. It, it's connected. It's relevant to our content. So let's see. Let's look at a map of Asia. All right. So check this out. Okay. All right. So if we're looking here, Korea is right up here. Korea looks like it's it's very it's very close to Russia. It's coming off of China, and it's almost like Japan gives it a hug. So you can see why Japan easily took over Korea, right? Now, China below China, you have Vietnam also comes off China. All right, and so here is where Vietnam is, and it is significantly lower. It is more like jungle. It's, it's very much tropic, where Korea actually gets really cold. Um, and so they're very, very different. Is that How, yes. Okay, so does that make a little more sense to you? Yeah. Hey, listen, until sometimes you see things, like visually, when those two get talked about together, it makes it sound like, they, oh, they must be close to each other. So if you remember, Vietnam is going to be split at the 38th parallel. I'm sorry, Korea is split at the 38th parallel. Vietnam is split at the 17th. So that may kind of help it distinguish for you. All right, so West Germany, we basically allow West Germany to start ruling itself. It can be in NATO, it can be in the UN, and it does both of those. Another very significant thing happens in the Cold War. Stalin dies. Aww. And eventually, a new leader is going to come to power in the Communist Party of the United or of the Soviet Union, and that is going to be Nikita Khrushchev. Now, he is also grandfatherly, isn't he? In fact, it's kind of funny. You have two old guys like that are now ruling the Cold War. He was like that neighbor. He's like always mad at something. Here's the other thing that's interesting about Nikita. Some of the first choices he makes are very positive. For instance, not long after becoming the leader in the USSR, Nikita Khrushchev comes out and he says, I want you to know about the horrible things Stalin did. And he tells about the purges. So, yeah. And so, if for him to announce that, that kind of seems like he's admitting fault, right? Which is something Russians aren't notorious for doing. So we're like, okay, maybe we're liking some Nikita here. And then there are two little countries that are Russian satellites. And the first one is Poland. Poland holds a demonstration. A demonstration is people out picketing with signs demanding things. Now, traditionally with Russia, how well does that go over? <laughs> In fact, Russia meets some of their demands. We're like, okay, we see you, Khrushchev. And Hungary's like, we see you too. Uh, Heliana, go to 257 to Miss Rebecca's office right behind you. And so here's what happens. Hungary decides they're going to try the same thing, and Russia's like, nope. not so fast, Hungary. And so they end up squashing the rebellion in Hungary and creating a puppet government. So a little bit of a mixed message here, right? What does that mean? Puppet government means that, like, they remove everybody from power and put people in power who are yes men. That'll do what they tell them. Basically, they're the ones pulling the strings. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, oh, okay, sure, Poland, here you go. You get what you want Hungary. I'm not so fast. Thus, any of you younger children? Yeah, you know how that is. <laughs> Fun times. Now, let's talk about the Eisenhower Doctrine, which is the next thing on your outline. And it's very important that you grasp this. I'm going to make this really easy for you because the politics of what happened is kind of complicated. And what happened there actually doesn't affect us. It's more how we respond to it. So I'm going to make it pretty simple, okay? So there is a conflict between Israel and Egypt. And we're trying to be friends with both because, one, Israel's our ally, and two, Egypt has oil. oil. When in doubt, go with the oil, right? The two answers in the Middle East are always Israel, oil. So here's what goes down. 
So basically, Britain and France are getting involved. Russia's getting involved. There's bombing of airfields. There's all this kind of, it's getting crazy. And so Eisenhower commits to the Middle East what becomes known as the Eisenhower Doctrine. Stick with me on this. And that is we will send money to help Middle Eastern nations fight communist and, if necessary, troops. So the Truman Doctrine we would send money for containment of communists. The eyes in, in what area? What area is the Truman Doctrine? Korea. Europe. Europe. Particularly greasy turkey. Thanksgiving, right? Truman's Thanksgiving dinner. Greasy turkey. Eisenhower, Eisenhower E, Middle East, Egypt. We will send money and troops to prevent the spread of communism. communism. So basically our policies of preventing communism are spreading too, aren't they? So it starts with Europe, and then it leaks down, and then now we're talking about troops. So it's escalating. E for Eisenhower, E for escalating, E for Egypt. All right. So where it really escalates, though, is space. So first of all, we feel like we're still doing really good because we get the H-bomb first. I mean, we had the atomic bomb first, and now we have the H-bomb first. What's the H-bomb? A hydrogen bomb. It is only like a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb. Instead of like boom, it's like boom. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the, oh, the, the, yes, it does leave radiation as well. So just to show you this real quickly before we get into the tennis ball with legs. So here are the technological advances that happened just in the 1950s. Uh, first of all, the IBM mainframe computer, and you don't have to memorize this list. Second, the hydrogen bomb test is successful. Third, DNA is discovered. Yay. We actually realize, hey, there's this thing. We don't know what it means yet. It's going to take a little while. But it, we know it's there, and we know it's important. Uh, the sock vaccine tests are tested successfully for polio. So we are all very grateful for that. Uh, also, the first commercial U.S. nuclear power plants. And so the idea was to use atoms to create nuclear power. In fact, uh, right below my hometown is one that has never actually been in operation because people become so afraid of nuclear meltdown with these. It's really creepy. It's like just there. And billions of dollars, were, billions of dollars were spent on all of these. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, and then in 1958, we create NASA. And in 1959, you see the first seven astronauts in their press conference. But before we get there. Let's talk about what's going to happen with Sputnik. So, October Skies is a great film. If you ever get a chance to watch it, it's probably on one of the places where you can watch stuff for free. Oh, yeah. What is it? We watched we watched this in a science class. Oh, probably. I used to, it was one I used to show some, like if it was necessary for testing or something. But it's always, I mean, usually when I show it, they would be like, oh, yeah, let's all that science. It's about the four boys, the rocket boys, and it's about uh, the guy's name is like Herbert, I think, and he ends up wanting to be a scientist and wanting to because he's inspired by Sputnik, and he's based on a real guy. So, yeah. So check this out. This is Sputnik. Sputnik was launched by the Russians. What it basically is is a small satellite. All satellite means is an object that goes through space. Sputnik 1 is going to be called Sputnik 1 because they're going to have a Sputnik duel. And so what Sputnik 1 does is it manages to circum, uh, to circle the Earth. And, like, this is terrifying because this means once you can send a satellite into space with a signal, that makes the possibility of push-button nuclear weapons a reality. So what would be to keep us, or to keep them from putting a nuclear weapon on that, that thing goes up, and whenever it wants to, boom, explode. Versus before, you had to take a plane and drop it out. And so with the plane, there's the idea that, hey, you have some safety zone there. You know, you can watch what planes fly over. But with this, it's above the atmosphere. You don't know. You don't you know. Shoot. 
So it's scary. So check this out. Uh, then they're going to turn around and they're going to launch Sputnik Tool, which actually has the first live animal in it. Does anybody know what animal was in Sputnik? Okay. That was our first animal. It was a dog named Latka. And by the way, Latka, there was no... Um, there was like no food in there with Latka, and there was no way for like him to come down anyway. So I guess they were like, we do not waste food. So yeah. So Latka has like the statue in Russia. He's a little Jack Russell, and yeah, he has this like statue. I have a feeling he's floating somewhere in space, and he's very mad. If he's like my Jack Russell, he probably tried to get up. All right. So how do we respond to a full pit? Here's how, and this is significant. We realized some important things. One, we're behind now. We were ahead and we're behind. Two, our students, our children are not being educated with the same math and science they're being educated with in Russia. In fact, there are classes that you are taking that you have already taken that probably weren't even available to your grandparents <coughs> or great-grandparents if they went to um, an American high school in the 40s and 50s. Uh, my dad was in high school when this would have been early high school even about 15 when this happened and so he actually ends up taking a lot of math classes and he was a chemistry physics major and there was such a shortage of chemistry physics teachers because of the national defense education act that he actually got a sign-on bonus as a teacher to go to a school and teach physics because they couldn't find people to teach it like he had five schools that were offering this one to pay more money and this one's like no we'll raise that money because they were so desperate the eisenhower education act allocates extra money for to add these math and science classes particularly like most high schools did not offer algebra and if you've seen the movie with the boys yeah. like they're trying to get it in calculus and they're like people here don't take calculus you don't need that kind of math they didn't offer classes. They might offer a biology class, but they didn't offer like chemistry. They didn't offer physics. Those kind of classes were not focused on. They start to change their focus on languages also. They want to encourage students to take languages, particularly big incentives for taking Chinese and Russian for obvious reasons. And so we begin to shift our focus to say, okay, we're not creating people they can do the kind of math and science we need done to create these things. And so this happens with the National Defense Education Act. All right. NASA. NASA is formed. It is the National Aeronautic and Space Administration. And so NASA's job is to catch up to where we were. So with all of these new rockets being sent into space, People start to see UFOs. Oh, yes. UFOs, movies about UFOs, comics about UFOs, all start to become more popular. Hey, baby. Can I go to the log now? You look familiar. Yes, you can. This one, me? So both my back. Okay, boo. I'll put it away. Okay. All right, buddy. Be sweet. Okay, I will. Birthday. Oh, Micah, come here. What? Come here. What is we it? need your help. It's Aurelis's birthday. Oh. We sing happy birthday. Oh. 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 It's very important. <laughs> I think he's coming back. He may just be celebrating his whole way there. All right. So what you're going to see is the term alien starts to be used for people from other planets. Now think about when we hear the term alien, that's probably automatically where we go is like foreign alien from space. However, the term alien had previously been used and it was still some no. people from other countries. Let me put a book on. All right, ready? <laughs> yeah. Ready, set, go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Aurelian. Happy birthday to you. No, I don't know. Twist, twist, twist. Go, Micah, go. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I thought he brought you that tree, but I think he kept it, so I must have been. Happy birthday, Adonis. So what we see 
is this metaphor of foreign aliens from outer space being a metaphor for foreign influence from communists. Um, and so these are aliens who want to come and invade our planet. They want to come and take over our minds. And so it's this whole metaphor for communism. All right. So this idea of nuclear weapons causes a lot of anxiety. Causes a lot of anxiety because people begin to realize that they could drop a bomb and blow us up at any minute. And so the government develops a whole process by which you can protect yourself. And this is taught to school children. And it is called Duck and Cover. And so in just a few minutes, I'm going to show you the video of Duck and Cover and Birth the Turtle. And so the idea, now, you know, you think about it, we practice things like fire drills. Why? Because the fire drill literally works. We had a few fires here. And guess what? It works. Nobody died. Well, that'll work. It does work. The duck and cover. The duck and cover. If we had a direct hit with an atomic bomb, <laughs> it's not going to matter where you are. You're going to disintegrate. Wait, oh. wasn't that like, didn't they tell people like, yeah, you know, like, in full of the same And for an atomic bomb, a direct yes. hit is as far as it's essential. So, yeah. what, what, so what, check this out. So remember how I talked to you guys about the fact that there is radiation? Yeah. Here's why. Wait, are we going to go into war or something? Mm. Yeah, we are. All right, listen. Listen. Remember how I told you that we have radiation? Yeah. Here's why. The U.S. itself, not including all the other nations that have tested atomic bombs, we ourselves have exploded over 217 nuclear weapons why? in the Pacific and in Nevada as tests. I mean, the perfection process. And, yeah, and yeah. I, I think it's a bit extreme. So wait, like, how big of an area was the hydrogen bomb? Like, I, well, usually they, they did, actually, the hydrogen bomb, they used an island mm -hmm. out in the Pacific. Uh, are you familiar with SpongeBob? Yes. Where does SpongeBob live? In a pineapple under the sea. But where is that? It was in Bikini Bottom, which is actually the island Bikini Atoll. Because Bikini Atoll was an island that was completely exploded by a hydrogen bomb. And that is why SpongeBob and all of his friends were mutated. Whoa! Is that, is that like Wait, is that my family that family that's family. not suitable? It's real. No, it's because she's a squirrel underwater. <laughs> All right. So our first satellite into space is Explorer 1. So they have this cool neck. We have Explorer 1. Okay. Yeah. All right. And as we said, the possibility of what's called ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Push button warfare is what becomes fearful to us. Now, as you guys, and uh, this was, a, they would tell you build these nuclear shelters. And you could like build this in your house and people would live in these and they would save up canned food and other things. It's basically a storm shelter. And the idea is if you stayed in here for two weeks, then you could come out and the radiation would all be gone. Oh, so, like, that doesn't like, take 10 years? Or more. Here's the thing, guys. It's the false sense of security. It's developing that false sense of security is what keeps Americans, because basically the significant thing is that we feel safe. You know, like when you have like a company and monsters or and they all stay in and like monsters all the way out there, but they're in your ball and shelter. Oh, we watched it! I was there too. Anyway, all right. So, let's watch Birth the Turtle together. Dum dum, 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 dum dum